So now thanks to Mona and to the RCC for hosting us um, and providing us with a place that is not a pub but next door to a shop where we can buy beers to fund our research. Um, so just a short content note before we kick off. Uh, this talk contains a discussion of police violence as well as anti-black and anti-indigenous racism. And our slides illustrate various policing mechanisms, but we've really taken care to avoid displaying graphic images or the faces of protesters. So just to flag that. So on April 30th, 1992, weather satellites above California reported a thermal anomaly across South Central Los Angeles. And later the same day, local news described the event as, quote, an earthquake of sorts, a social upheaval of immense magnitude. As one reporter observed, viewers within broadcasting range would already be breathing in the smoke clouds that hung over the city. And in each of these accounts, the widespread riots that followed the acquittal of four LAPD officers filmed beating Rodney King register as a meteorological event, a state of environmental crisis, a disruption of the weather. So in the aftermath of the six-day uprising, black feminist scholar Sylvia Winter wrote an open letter to her colleagues at Stanford University in which she articulates structural relations between the riots, the racialized distribution of police violence, and the ways in which policing had come to shape the city's environment. Referring to an internal code used by the LAPD to designate cases involving black and Latinx Angelinos, the acronym NHI, No Humans Involved, names a form of epistemic violence that rationalizes the use of deadly force in the maintenance of white supremacy and intersects with broader structures of ecological degradation and social death that render certain lives as disposable. Quote, as is the case with the also hitherto discardable environment and its ongoing pollution, Winter writes, the reality of the throwaway lives have not been hitherto easily perceivable. Those deemed surplus to the requirements of racial capitalism and assigned the acronym NHI, she suggests, are, quote, like the environment, the negative systemic costs that are not perceivable within the logic of our present. For Jesse Jackson, a veteran of the civil rights movement, the LA riots expressed years of states' abandonment. Quote, what we saw was a kind of spontaneous combustion, he recalls. And you can't have spontaneous combustion without discarded materials. What you find in urban areas is people who have been discarded for a long time. They finally exploded. Where Jackson's combustive metaphor offers a sense of this kind of spontaneous reflexive action spreading, as it were, like wildfire, Winter's political ecology of the riot instead renders vis visible an entire climactic of systemic and environmental racism that has its origins long before and endures long after 1992. And so following Winter and situating her insights against an emergent body of work on policing, atmospherics and poetics, this talk today aims to articulate two overarching questions. First, how might attending to the environmental conditions of social revolt and riot control entail a political ecology of policing? And then second, how does a focus on policing as the production of racist environments require us in turn to reorient the politics of environmental justice towards an abolitionist horizon. And navigating between these two lines of inquiry, we trace a poetics of insurrection in the black radical tradition since the 1960s, and in doing so, attempt to delineate what we see as an increasingly urgent intersection between the politics of abolition and environmentalism. So the theory of revolt has a long history, obviously. In the 1970s, however, riots garnered renewed attention from Marxist historians looking to contextualize contemporary struggle in an age of deindustrialization, mass unemployment, and dispossession against pre industrial forms of mass politics. Writing on the bread riots of the 18th century, E.P. Thompson offered a foundational reframing of the event based to the structural. Against characterizations of the food riot as, quote, a direct, spasmodic, irrational response to hunger. Thompson instead reads popular uprisings as a form of direct action with very tangible strategic aims. Lowering the price of bread, stalling the encroachment of industrial capitalism, or freeing fellow rioters from prison. 
While Winter's environmental reading of the LA riots articulates a similar reorientation from meteorological anomaly to structural antagonism, Jesse Jackson's image of spontaneous combustion reminds us of the discursive strategies by which ecological metaphors can work to obscure the environmental conditions or strategic demands of popular uprisings. In the prose of counterinsurgency, Banerjit Guha articulates how this intersection of insurrection and environment often has an explicitly reactionary function. As Guha observes, this function is dyed into most narratives by metaphors assimilating peasant revolts to natural phenomena. They break out like thunderstorms, heave like earthquakes, spread like wildfires, infect like epidemics. In other words, when the proverbial clod of earth turns, this is a matter to be explained in terms of natural history. Planting what Guha calls the praxis of rebellion in the rhetorical grounds of nature serves then to depoliticize and organicize revolt, effacing the collective agency and the structural conditions that mobilize the forms of popular resistance designated riot by police. So if the language of the riot often invites this kind of ecological reading, take for instance um, the tactical imperative to be water, which spread from Hong Kong to Kenosha in 2020, we want to resist the adoption of this elemental idiom. Rather than an ecological reading of the riot form, today we're interested in giving an account of how policing, from the prose of counterinsurgency to the violent procedures of crowd control, simultaneously produces and enforces ideas of a natural order, within which the riot appears as rupture, catastrophe, or crisis. And in doing so, we draw on quite recent work by David Correa and Tyler Wall, who argue that policing itself is a mode of environment making, which fundamentally relies on claims to nature and the natural. Within the naturalized social order that the state assumes and the police enforce, the interpretive manufacture of resistance as riot or crisis enables the suspension of juridical norms and the legitimization of militarized weaponry such as tear gas and sound cannons. And perhaps nowhere is this convergence of discursive, juridical, and military apparatus more apparent than the state repression of indigenous protest at Standing Rock in 2016. As Paiute scholar Kristen Simmons points out in an essay titled Settler Atmospherics, North Dakota police, police deployed the interstate governance agreement, EMAC, ostensibly intended for use only in the case of natural disasters such as hurricanes or wildfires to bring the full force of 76 different law enforcement agencies to bear. Testing riot control techniques on stationary water protectors who were protesting the Dakota Access Pipeline Law enforcement employed tear gas, armored vehicles, sonic weaponry, and water cannons laced with pepper spray. Where Stuart Hall's famous text, Policing the Crisis, traced how economic crises were used to justify expanded police powers and racial profiling in the 1970s, the policing of the climate crisis has only intensified this logic of control. And tellingly, I think, Standing Rock marked only the second instance in which EMAC was used outside of its intended remit. The first, in 2015, was the Baltimore uprising that followed the police murder of Freddie Gray. And in both of these instances, the use of EMAC against indigenous water protectors and Black Lives Matter activists demonstrates the weaponization of crisis narratives to contain dissent. Rendered analogous with environmental crises, black and indigenous uprisings are configured as anomalous or exceptional events, as opposed to centuries-long struggles against settler colonialism and racial capitalism. So, <clears throat> for Simmons, however, then, the riot control strategies deployed against water protectors at Standing Rock make tangible the dispersed violence of settler atmospherics that extends from the occupation of unceded territories and the choking of waterways to the pollution of the atmosphere. Offering an early articulation of the atmospherics of colonial con occupation and anti-colonial um, resistance, psychiatrist Franz Fanon figured combat breathing as a condition of accretive asphyxiation that characterized a respiratory politics oriented towards the transformation of unbearable atmospheres into livable environments. Detailing a history of anti-black violence through asphyxiation, Christina Sharps uh, in The Wake argues that in this sense, the weather is not only a meteorological, but also fundamentally socio-ecological, an accretion of atmospheric conditions that constitutes, quote, the totality of the environments in which we struggle. The pervasive milieu of uneven exposure that persists from LA in 1992 to Baltimore in 2015 appears in Sharp's terms as a climate that is anti-black. 
If the struggle for breath has come to shape the horizons of resistance and survival, a state of precariousness encapsulated in Eric Garner's final words, I can't breathe. Sharp describes the continued mobilization of street protests, prison abolition movements, and the mutual aid systems as the production of, quote, microclimates, in which you don't accede to everything that would try to suffocate you. Drawing on Fanon's account of insurgent respiration, Sharp uses the term aspiration as both an orientation towards hope and an exhalation of breath to describe an atmospheric counter disposition. So if Sharp's concept of the weather prompts us to reread the riot as the possible locale of aspirational breathing, this heuristic also becomes central to the account of poetics often by Jean Thomas Tremblay in their recent monograph, Breathing Aesthetics. And you can see the text they're drawing from just here. Throughout the book, Tremblay traces the, quote, emergence of breath as both a record of injury and a political vernacular, contending that poetry frames the act of conspiring together as, quote, more than an index of crises, a resource for living through them. And following this trajectory from combat breathing to breathing aesthetics, we want to suggest that the archive of black radical poetry in the 1960s offers a literary resource for reading these atmospheric antagonisms, the atmospherics of revolt, the aesthetics of breath, and the politics of collective respiration are all central to Gwendolyn Brooks's 1969 pamphlet, Riot. Written in the wake of the Chicago uprisings that followed the assassination of Martin Luther King, the poem both captures the racist imagination that works to organicize revolt and reframes riots as a moment in which anti-black logics of atmospheric containment are disrupted. So opening with King's memorable axiom, that a riot is the language of the unheard. Brooks's poem's um, poetic sequence adopts the white perspective of John Cabot, through whose eyes the dehumanized mass of, quote, sweaty and unpretty poor register as a natural disaster. Moving in, sweet, in seas, in wind sweep, the riot is experienced by Cabot as the touch of racially coded breath that is, in Brooks's terms, both indiscreet and undetainable. The cacophony of the Chicago riots and Cabot's white panic eventually recedes in the sequence as Brooks describes the aftermath of the uprising from the perspective of its participants in the final moments of the poem. Shifting from Cabot's perspective to the perspective of those actually on the ground in what the poem calls the, quote, time of not to end, protesters gather and disperse freely, reflecting on the moment of collective respite, respiration, and political possibility. While the so-called long, hot summers of mid-1960s are rarely taken up in relation to environmental politics of the period, reading Brooks's work through Sharp and Fanon reframes both the riot and the poem as social forms through which collectives might aspire or conspire to breathe freely. As Tremblay suggests, approaching poetics through an attention to the aesthetics of breathing can alert us to the ways in which poems come to mediate the precarity of breath, the production of anti-black atmospheres, and the possibility of resistant microclimates. So then while breathing aesthetics sets out to trace an atmospheric shift since the 1970s, the Tremblay characterizes as, quote, the pollution, the pollution monetization, and weaponization of the atmosphere, <laughs> We're interested today in how the latter has come to underpin strategies of riot control and how chemical weapons relate to wider structures of environmental violence. In her exhaustive history of CS gas, Anna Feigenbaum charts how the chemical compound commonly known as tear gas becomes, in her terms, an environmental weapon in the mid-1960s. After the military use of chemical weaponry was banned, the emergence of tear gas manufacturing as a profitable industry for law enforcement required the categorization of tear gas as a, quote, less than lethal weapon. The legal definition of tear gas as a tool of crowd dispersal is often far removed from its effects, which include blinding, choking, and increased chances of miscarriage or long-term respiratory problems. And on the right here, you can see, uh, I'll just click through, uh, a list of strategic effects indexed by the 1964 manual, uh, police manual for CS gas, while on the left, there's a recent activist field guide uh, that details both the ecological damage caused by tear gas and the environmental conditions in which the supposedly non-lethal weapon exceeds its classification. In the 1960s, as now, health risks were routinely downplayed as gas was fired into enclosed spaces at short range and far in excess of the recommended parameters. If tear gas, as Feigenbaum puts it, polices the atmosphere and pollutes the very air we breathe, and the policing of the civil rights movement became the testing ground for a new era of riot control, one defined by what Feigenbaum calls 
atmospheric policing. So, <clears throat> turning now to two poems by Langston Hughes, uh, a close comrade of Brooks in the 1960s, the poetry of this period very much reflects both the adoption of chemical weapons by an increasingly militarized police force and the ways in which the spectacular atmospheric violence of the tear gas canister condenses these more dispersed and accretive dynamics described by Sharp or Fanon. Published in 1966, three years before Brooks's riot, the title of the poem, Demonstration, which you can see here, carefully captures both the protest itself, the spectacle of state power, and the capacity of the poem to demonstrate the promise of police abolition and black liberation. Here, Hughes opens by recounting the weaponization of water and air as the disorienting and devastating effects of CS gas, quote, burn your day, your night, your dawn. Against the absolute negation of time in the hold of atmospheric policing, the poem shifts instead to an affirmation abolition as a new dawn, quote, when the cops forget their jails, when the tear gas canisters are dry. So this rebuttal of atmospheric disorientation with abolitionist resolution and the function of riot control in demonstrating wider systems of anti-black violence, I think anticipates Akruga and Majulu's more recent reflections on the George Floyd uprising. The violent policing of BLM in 2020, she writes, offers a demonstration of the stark reality of living under white supremacy. Echoing Winter's open letter, No Humans Involved, Emma Julie suggests that tear gas, quote, can be very clarifying. America offers lessons every day about who it values, who belongs, and who is human. Follow the tear gas, she concludes. Many answers to your questions about America, past and present, are there. So, in the 1933 poem, Wait, Hughes does precisely this. Trailing the stench of gas that saturates the insurgent grounds of Depression-era food riots, the poem's central column describing anti-black violence is surrounded on the page by the material commodities, occupied territories, and dispossessed populations of colonial accumulation. Johannesburg miners, unemployed millions, Haiti, sugar, labor, through this formal distribution on the page of supply chains, surplus populations, and colonial sites of extraction, Hughes invites us to draw connections between the police violence of tear gas and what he describes at the very end of the poem as the gas of capitalism. To follow the tear gas, then, is to track its stench across transnational histories of occupation and dispossession that precede the domestic use of CS gas, a mode of violence that unites the settler atmospherics of colonial plunder and the total climate of anti-blackness under US capitalism. This kind of transnational trajectory also runs parallel to Dariush Tehrani's analysis of tear gas as an atmospheric form of colonial control, suggesting that, quote, toxicity in our colonial context is an event only for the privileged, while it composes a fundamental aspect of life for the colonized. Tehrani prompts us to move beyond what he describes as the aura of spectacle and toward the global circulation of chemical weaponry and policing strategies that configure breathlessness as an everyday condition. Like Hughes's poem, Tirani points us to the supply chains of what Feigenbaum calls the riot industrial complex. So in this respect then, the tear gas canisters depicted in demonstration condense the wider atmospheric conditions of toxification and asphyxiation. Arguing that the distinction between toxic breathability and unbreathability is simply a matter of relative pressure or density, Christina Sharp uses the term gradual asphyxiation to link the chokehold used in the police murder of Eric Garner with the slow violence of toxic contamination encapsulated by the water crisis that is still ongoing in Flint, Michigan. During the George Floyd uprising, in Portland, local and federal law enforcement, de enforcement deployed such a relentless barrage of chemical weaponry that the Oregon Department of Environmental Quality raised concerns over the poisoning of public waterways. Where the biopolitics of toxicity has long been central to the demands of environmental justice movements seeking the equitable distribution of breathable atmospheres and drinkable water, following the tear gas in this manner articulates links between environmental racism, atmospheric policing, and transnational infrastructures of state violence. So, as we continue this work on tear gas, and we're very much at the beginning of this project as well, we're also interested in how riots manifest as a strategic contest over the breathability of atmosphere at a local level, how protesters develop their own transnational networks for sharing tools and tactics. And a report on the George Floyd uprising published by Unity and Struggle last year 
describes the exchange of techniques between protesters in Portland and Hong Kong as a tactical ecosystem that arose in response to daily clouds of tear gas. This is tactics from the use of flags and balloons to determine wind direction to the strategic deployment of leaf blowers, which you can see on the right there, uh, to form breathable spaces within a wider controlled and toxic atmosphere. And at the same time, we're invested in tracing how poetry registers these changes uh, in the logics, tactics, and terrains of protest and riot control. Whereas the spectacle of the tear gas cloud kind of draws the violence of policing clearly into view as a form of environment making, the rise of surveillance and counter surveillance technologies in the form of smartphones and body cams has also engendered a turn towards less visible forms of acoustic control, such as sonic cannons. We've mentioned these briefly before, and then on this note, we want to close our talk today by talking a little bit about the next phase of this research, which tracks this kind of shift in the armory of atmospheric policing from gas and into sound. <clears throat> so first deployed by the US military in the early 2000s, the long range acoustic device or LRAD has two primary functions, to amplify and to impair. Since its first deployment in Iraq, the LRAD has become a staple of contemporary crowd control strategies, appearing at the front lines of both Standing Rock and Black Lives Matter movements. Emitting a targeted sound beam up to 5,500 metres in distance and loud enough to cause pain at 20 metres, the LRAD's tones are designed to overlap with the most sensitive part of our hearing, the range of human speech. So even the briefest exposure to these sound cannons can cause a range of bodily dis responses from nausea and tinnitus to migraines and almost immediate hearing damage, as the weaponization of the airwaves shifts the locus of atmospheric violence from the respiratory to the auditory. And of course, in response to this increasingly aggressive policing of airwaves, new tactics have come to the fore. Over the first weekend of the George Floyd uprising, the police scanner app 5 Radio was downloaded over 500,000 times. Tapping into the frequencies of police radio, users were then able to monitor their movements and organize accordingly. In Chicago, anonymous hackers used a stolen police radio to infiltrate and sabotage communication channels, playing NWA's classic, Fuck the Police on repeat in order to incapacitate the dispatch office. As the Canadian poet and abolitionist organizer Mercedes Eng puts it in her account of indigenous and anti-capitalist protests against the Vancouver Olympics, the quote, sonics of surveillance have become a primary target of state policing and resistance. Describing here the closure of the pirate radio station 91.5 FM, which had been used to broadcast the radio show Short Range Poetic Device, in the run-up to the Olympics, Eng configures poetry as a mode of counter-surveillance that, quote, cannot be captured by your closed-circuit cameras. And here, Eng's poetics extends the aesthetics of breathing towards the opening of alternative transmissions that exceed state control, situating the reoccupation of regulated sound waves as a tool of both collective action and artistic production. Describing the riot as a mode of sonic insurgency, black feminist scholar Sadia Hartman refrains the racially coded figurations of noise as a form of sonic excess that is crucial to the power of the riot. For her, the cacophony of improvisation emerges as a countermeasure to state logics of enclosure and auditory regulation. Tracing what she terms a minor history of noise riots, Hartman's wayward lives, beautiful experiments, argues that the improvised cacophony of the crowd represents, quote, collaboration in the space of enclosure, which makes audible a range of aesthetic possibilities that are capable of, quote, creating an, an opening where there was none. Rephrasing Martin Luther King, Hartman's insistence that broken windows and shattered glass are the language of the riots, she tethers the choral refusal of the sonic, uh, of sonic order into the rejection of state logics that value the sanctity of property over black life. <coughs> Um, and I, I, this scene is making me think of the, the middle image at the beginning of Brooks's riot, if you saw the, the, kind of the words glass kind of shattering in the background of that image. So in her 1987 poem, uh, Boy Breaking Glass, Gwendolyn Brooks translates this language of atmospheric revolt, of sonic insurgency, um, uh, first embodied in riot, into a scene of sonic transgress and property destruction. Here, a broken window is, quote, a cry of art, is raw, is sonic. The speaker draws a direct line between vandalism and the aesthetics as the abolition and refashioning of the hostile environment um, kind of has this really declarative moment. I shall create, if not a note, a whole, if not an overture, a desecration. 
Clearing the air, the forcible opening of these new frames of perception takes on an aspirational or atmospheric register as the shattering of glass lets in another, more plural climate. Quotes, each one other is having different weather. So reflecting on the 2020 uprisings in New York City, the poet and artist Hannah Black recalls the feeling of, quote, broken windows like breathing holes in an airless world. You feel different when the weather touches you, she writes. In Black's lyrical essay, which precedes her recent fictional account of the riots, configures the work of abolition not only as the absence of police, but as the presence of a world made otherwise. The opening of the outside was an accidental effect of the uprising, she writes. By providing new uses for public space, by uprooting street furniture, smashing plate glass windows into piles of jewels, and pedestrianizing highways, the riots demonstrated that all objects can be transformed. When the young people say, New York will breathe, or abolition now, they mean it. They go outside, and for a few hours, they make an image of the present condition of freedom. To us, this passage articulates a specific relation between the politics of environmental justice and the politics of abolition, invoking the opening of an outside, a condition of freedom in spite of and inside settler atmospherics and anti-black weathers. It reflects both an emergent body of scholarship on the intersection of abolition and environmentalism and the increasing intersection of these struggles on the ground. We first conceded this project I think in 2021, after the uprisings of the previous year, and a lot has changed since then. Mm. We've seen the emergence of new academic fields, such as black ecology, or the expansion of Ruth Wilson Gilmore's work on abolition geographies towards a growing body of work under the name of abolition ecology. And at the same time, the political terrain has shifted immensely. So in the conversation that follows, we might also think about Stop Cop City, the ongoing struggle to defend the Wilani Forest from plans to build a police training facility on the site of a former plantation and prison farm in Atlanta, Georgia. Or slightly closer to home, the violent eviction of the protest camp at Lutzra, where police have quite literally ensured that the wheels of fossil capital continue to turn. As activists at Lutzi send messages of solidarity following the murder of forest defender Manuel Turan at the Stop Cop City camp last week, the police murder, I should say, the intersection of these struggles has rarely been more evident in my lifetime. That's all from us. We'd really welcome feedback at this stage. Um, it's a project that's developing and we're really looking forward to talking about it over the next half an hour or so. Thank you. Thank you.